I want to welcome a speaker who is knowledgeable about the things that we're all interested in. Sharad Karur, since 2003, has been the executive director of the Ontario Nonprofit Housing Association, where he leads a team of dedicated staff and board members to represent 760 nonprofit housing providers in the areas of policy, advocacy, research, government relations, education, member support, communications, and group procurement. Prior to this, Sherrod spent 17 years from 1985 to 2002 with the Association of Municipalities of Ontario as director in a variety of different policy and corporate capacities. While there, he helped to create and was the first CEO of Local Authority Services Limited, a wholly owned subsidiary company to the uh, Association of <coughs> Municipalities of Ontario, providing a $600 million investment fund, along with several group procurement products that services and services that were specific to the needs of the municipalities. In 2002, he left to join OMEX, the Ontario Municipal Insurance Exchange, as Director of Corporate Services, to expand the use of structured pooled insurance programs. And previously, he served on the board of the Wellesley Institute and currently serves on the board of the Trillium Housing Nonprofit Corporation and the Social Housing Sector's Asset Management Center. Please welcome Sharad Karuna. And uh, so I'm, I'm hoping I can uh, do him proud uh, by being here today and, and talking to you a little bit about the social housing sector. Um, and, and where we are and where we're going forward. I, I've been in the nonprofit uh, business in one way, shape, or form and dealing with government for over 35 years. And so one of the things I've come to appreciate is the power of local community groups and local individuals such as yourselves who are absolutely key to making this province uh, whole. Um, and uh, you know we share uh, you know we share a lot in common. So I hope you don't mind if I read some prepared remarks. I have um, the laser surgery actually that I had last September didn't quite account for the fact that I can't actually see what's in front of me, despite the fact that it's humongous print in front of me. So for, so so forgive me. Um, and as Sherman said, I am the executive director of the Ontario Nonprofit Housing Association. Um, we are a member-based organization representing 760 nonprofit housing uh, organizations across Ontario that house uh, 400,000 people, and that's, you know, by the map, the equivalent of a small city, um, or actually several small cities in, in Ontario. In Toronto itself, we have uh, nearly 300 members who range in size from Toronto Community Housing that has 58,000 uh, homes and communities across the city all the way to supportive and affordable uh, units such as that in Park, at the Parkdale Activity Recreation Center um, that houses 12 people. So we have a full breadth of, of organizations that we represent. And our members house a variety of different um, uh, individuals. Seniors, low to moderate income families, the working poor, Aboriginal people, victims of violence and, and abuse, people living with developmental disabilities, mental illness, HIV AIDS, um, or those who uh, have addictions, and uh, especially as well the formerly homeless and the hard to house. So it's a very wide range of individuals whom our members um, uh, help every day. And like you, we really believe in the notion of affordable housing and the fact that it's a basic human right, um, and that all Ontarians deserve a safe and secure place to call their home. But the other thing we know is that housing is foundational, and by that I mean Without good housing, people's health are at risk, stress is heightened, education outcomes become precarious, and individual economic independence and sustainability are very hard to come by. And I think we also agree that all three levels of government, municipal, provincial, and federal, have a shared responsibility to support affordable housing and assist people struggling with homelessness. We are committed to developing a strong and vital nonprofit housing sector. Through our research, professional development, and advocacy activities, we offer many of the tools that groups such as yourselves need to help develop and deliver high quality affordable housing. And earlier this year, we released a new study called Big Problems Need Bold Solutions. And in it, what we did is we identified 
the most pressing housing challenges in Ontario. Those of what we refer to as persistent core need, um, those living, uh, sorry, the issue of homelessness and the ever uh, increasing capital backlog repair. And when we use the term persistent core housing need, what we're referring to are individuals who have spent three or more years struggling in housing that is either too small, too expensive, or in bad need of repair. The social housing capital backlog that many of you may have heard about refers to the fact that many of the existing housing is old stock that needs new roofs, new elevators, new um, uh, HVAC systems, and so on. And, so on. and that backlog uh, actually totals about $2.6 billion, that's with a B, um, in Ontario right across the board. So our research actually reveals that over the next 10 years, 168,000 households in Ontario will be in persistent core housing need, and at the same time, 10,000 people will become homeless. And based on our analysis, we found that these households could actually be lifted out of persistent core housing need and could avoid homelessness, and that capital repair backlog can in fact be tackled if our provincial government spent $1.3 billion per year for the next 10 years. And that sounds like a huge number, $1.3 billion. But in fact, it is only 1% of the entire provincial budget. And when you stack it up against the, cost, the fact that the healthcare budget in Ontario is $49 billion, and the education budget is $26 billion, $1.3 billion is just petty cash to be able to uh, actually help people in persistent poor housing need in the homeless. As an organization, we've been in business for 25 years, and the housing system of today is very different than the one we actually started with 25 years ago. In the mid-1990s, the production of purpose-built rental housing um, reached an all-time all low when existing rental units became increasingly converted to other uses. And while condominiums have accounted for most of the new rental units in Toronto in the past few years, Rent for a one-bedroom condo is 43% higher than the average rent for a purpose-built apartment, meaning that for many renters, condos are not a viable option. And yet, we have a policy framework for housing in Ontario put forward by the provincial government that believes that the marketplace um, is the best solution to be able to deliver housing. I will tell you that on a personal front, as uh, I don't regard myself as low or moderate income. According to the CRA, I am not. But I too struggle in, a, in Toronto to be able to afford a home. I can't afford to buy a house anymore. I can barely afford to rent uh, a condo and I'm having uh, trouble finding purpose-built rental in the city. So I can only imagine what it means for those who are uh, significantly less well-off than, than me. At the same time, governments have increasingly relied on the marketplace to provide that affordable housing. Economic shifts and population growth have created the need for government-assisted housing. Right now, there are 158,000 households in Ontario with an average wait time of three and a half years waiting for affordable housing. That's the highest number of households ever, um, especially since the Harris government downloaded housing to the municipal sector. And up until the year 2000, our social housing system was largely centralized, and the federal and provincial governments provided uh, funding through the construction of public housing projects. Back then, housing was produced uh, based on on-again, off-again, targeted uh, programs to specific populations by providing bricks and mortar solutions, but unfortunately without much credence to the support needs of people. At the end of the 1990s, the responsibility for managing affordable housing was devolved first from the federal government and then to the province, and then from the province to the municipalities. Now, while funding for the affordable housing and homelessness services comes from all three levels, there is a new middleman, and that is the municipalities. The result is a much more decentralized system. The advantage of having the current system is that a much more localized, tailored response to housing problems can be addressed. That is, you can build local solutions for local problems. And in fact, that is what is going on right now in the 47 municipal service manager areas throughout Ontario. They have been required under legislation to create 10-year housing and homelessness plans and instead of a one-size-fits-all uh, solution. And that's because the housing challenges are very different. So, for example, in New York region just north of us, where there is very little rental housing and very low vacancy rates, 
the solution set for solving the housing and homelessness situation there is going to be vastly different than in Windsor that have uh, high rates of unemployment and poverty levels but actually have very, very high vacancy rates and have a full abundance of, of, of housing. But the problem with the current system is that on their own, municipalities can't afford to solve the problem on their own. In Toronto, for example, the current average monthly rent for a one bedroom is $1,010 per month. Nearly three times the shelter allowance granted to somebody who is receiving uh, money through Ontario Works. Property taxes alone can't make up this difference for the thousands of individuals um, uh, that are required to have municipalities um, help them. Municipalities are just simply unable to provide enough affordable housing or rent supplements to prevent people from losing their home or winding up on the streets. Meanwhile, instead of stepping up to their responsibilities and funding affordable housing, the federal government and the provincial governments are increasingly stepping back. Government staff and politicians see the provision of affordable housing as a cost, when in fact, I believe they should be seeing it as an investment. They say that they are broke and they can't afford to increase funding even when legislative changes exist that would help housing providers build on their equity without costing the government a single cent. They continue to think of affordable housing in terms of bricks and mortar, when they should be thinking of the people and the families that it's helping by providing a solid foundation for their future. Even as recently as today's editorial in the Toronto Star and an article in the Grid, the point is made that while housing people is the socially right thing to do, from an economic standpoint, it is far less expensive than not providing housing at all. That's why we need to see the formation of a Liberal majority government as an opportunity to take a breath, gather our thoughts, and begin the process of re-engaging with the government on housing. Now is the time to leverage our current relationships and advocate directly to our leaders. Premier Wynne campaigned to a majority on the themes of economic growth and competitiveness, retirement security for seniors, cost containment, and strong social services. These are all areas that are directly impacted by housing and homelessness. On Tuesday, Premier Wynne announced her new cabinet, and she has announced that she will reveal her new anti-poverty strategy within 60 days of forming the government. So Premier Wynne, the clock is now ticking. On July 2nd, we expect to see the legislature resume a new throne speech, and a few days later, passage of the budget that was left behind when the election was first called. My understanding too is they're not even going to reprint the budget, they're just going to change the date on the cover. We should capitalize on this opportunity to engage with Queen's Park about the, the effects of housing insecurity and homelessness and ensure that the province delivers on its commitments outlined in the long-term affordable housing strategy and deliver on its promised budget of an investment in affordable housing uh, program, which will actually give Ontario $400 million over the next five years. It's a small amount, but it's a step in the right direction. But it's also important to remember that the new government is tasked with solving many problems, and simply bringing another problem to their attention will not accomplish anything. So as advocates, we need to be prepared to offer well-thought-out solutions that help direct them to connect the dots and speak to the broader public interest. This is a lesson that we've learned. Housing is not just an issue for the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing. It is an issue for the Ministry of Labor, the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Children's and Youth Services, the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, the Ministry of Community and Social Services, the Ministry of Transportation, the Ministry of Economic Development and Infrastructure, and many, many more. If children have a safe place to sleep at night, they will do better in school. If seniors have access to supportive housing, they will require less emergency services. If people are provided with a secure space to call home, they will be healthy, happier, more productive, and economically well off. They will depend less on government assistance and help to become part of the economic and social fabric of Ontario. We all know this, and we need to make sure that our government knows this too. So our advocacy efforts should not be limited to the province, however. Establishing solid working relationships and understanding the challenges that municipalities have, and in particular the municipal service manager, uh, community um, need to be understood as well in terms of affording, uh, uh, mobilizing the forces for change. It is also important that we understand passionately that the public is invested in this issue as well, even if it is absent from the political sound bites. We launched a public relations campaign in 2012 called Housing Opens Doors. We were amazed with the response. 
After visiting just six communities across the province, we received over 75,000 public endorsements of our message and heard from countless people about how affordable housing affects them and their community. ONPRO will continue to uh, provide our research on the housing sector and will continue to provide source material like our annual waiting list that details the number of applicants waiting for affordable housing across Ontario and to, uh, to help organizations such as yourselves. Finally, in looking forward, it is important for us as advocates not to underestimate the power of storytelling. As you note in your declaration, the very people we serve can be our greatest teachers. Their stories and lived experiences can go a long way in communicating the impacts of housing insecurity and homelessness, and also the successes brought about as a result of housing. Given that, let me tell you a little story myself that made a true impression on me and left me with a much better understanding of what housing can do for someone. It's a story of a tenant named Robert, who lives as a resident in one of the men's houses at Hecky Home, an ONFA member which provides housing for homeless and hard to house individuals and was created by seven faith-based groups. The executive director, Angie Haynes, was kind enough to help organize a study tour for some government officials who were hosting. One of the tenants, Robert, was kind enough to share his unit so we could see his accommodation and speak with him. On his wall, when I went entered his unit, was his high school diploma that he proudly framed. It was the same high school I went to, and Robert had graduated just one year after I left that high school in the 1970s. I was surprised to see it there. I was surprised to see Robert at, in this home. And I said to him, Robert, what happened? He said one word, drugs. And I lost everything. I lost my home, my family, my friends. I ended up on the street. But then Ecu Home helped me. First they housed me, then they provided me the supports I need. I'm not completely where I want to be, but I'm well on my way because of that home. I won't forget that moment, or forget Robert, because of that very brief encounter, it said it all to me. I'm very impressed by the actions and the accomplishments of the Multi-Faith Alliance to Animal Muslims. And I really look forward to working with you to ensure that all Ontarians have access to a safe, secure home that, in which they can grow and thrive. I thank you again for letting me be here today to talk to you, and I'd be happy to entertain any questions or any comments uh, and to hear from you. Thank you very much. Yes. Hundred fifty eight thousand people on the wait list. Yes. Hundred sixty eight. Now, but you said I said something. Oh, I'm sorry. But you weren't saying how long it was going to take to get them in there. Well, they. We have a ten, at least a ten or fifteen year waiting. Yeah, the average wait time in Ontario is about three and a half years, but it varies across the province. So there are very, very long wait times. If you walk into Housing Connections, one of the first signs you will see is how long it will take you to wait for a house for housing um, if you actually put in an application. So what we think is that that 158,000 number is actually a, a minimum number. Yes. We think that the number is actually much, much higher. And yeah, in fact, we, we, they do not keep track um, uh, well enough in rural and small urban Ontario because people are actually couch surfing and living in basements and living somewhere else. Was there a question back there? Okay. Yes, sir. You say that Premier Wynne with the Liberal majority government is an opportunity. Yes. We currently have municipal elections on October 27th of this year across the province. That's another opportunity. Absolutely. So the, so the point was that we have a municipal election coming up. And by the way, we have a federal election coming up next year. So I feel like I'm a professional voter right now. I should put that up. We should all put it on our resume. Um, so first things first then. How do we make the best use of the opportunity of the October 27th elections? Well, I think there are two ways to do it. The first way you can do it is approach. Is 
sorry, how can we make the best opportunity of the fact that there's a municipal election coming up to get our point across? Okay, that's basically the question. Um, so I think the first thing to do is to be able to communicate with all the candidates, particularly the top, the top candidates who are running, to be able to actually ask them, you know, ask the Multi-Faith Alliance uh, and Homelessness, ask them the question, what is their plan to deal with the homeless issue in Toronto? Um, and see what their response is. The other issue is to um, advocate using their platform. So for example, they are uh, very hot and heavy right now on the whole issue about transit in, uh, in Toronto. Well, transit and housing are very interlinked with one another. Um, people, you know, live right now in suburbs, can't get to their actually second and third jobs. So, um, so we need to be able to make those links. So those are the kinds of things to be able to, to actually bring forward um, to the candidates. Yeah. Nick. Thank you. Can you repeat that I, 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 Nick, why don't you come up here and talk in the microphone? It'll be a lot easier. <laughs> Our hand in the mic. I don't know how this thing, I don't know if that, that'll reach, actually. Maybe we can. Nick, Nick likes microphone. Thanks again, Sherrod. Uh, as I said, uh, I've been on the on for board and I've worked with Sherrod for the years he's been there and admire his leadership and direction. I think what's important, and you've given us some clues, but as advocates for affordable housing, what are some of the action steps that we can take that you found effective? I mean, I've gone to see federal MPs and provincial. They say, Nick, agree with you entirely about housing. It gets me no votes. I said, what are you talking about? They say, housing is we, they. We is education, health, transportation. They is housing. He said, if they don't come out and vote, then I annoy my voters if I push this item. So elections coming up, and I agree to success the Ontario election, what are four or five or six key points that we can put forward that's going to be persuasive? Uh, we're working on national housing strategy, and the ANFA conference is in Ottawa in November, and most of us will be going up to Parliament Hill also as a direct contact. But maybe you could give us as a group and as individuals five or six or more points of what's going to really make a difference. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for the question, Nick. I um, always um, always enjoy Nick's questions. They're always thought-provoking. Um, uh, there is no magic, you know, word or phrase you can use to get them to do things. But one of the things that I've learned working with government um, in my 35-year uh, career is that it is as important to listen to their problem as it is to explain your problem to them. And in fact, 90% of the time, they have a problem. I have yet to meet. Um, a party, you know, even if they're, if they're on the right side of the political spectrum or on the left side of the political spectrum, that doesn't believe in helping people. They believe in helping people. They just come at it from different ways. Conservatives believe in giving more money into the pockets of people, and uh, liberals and NDP believe more in social type programs to help people. But again, the bottom line is they're all willing to help people. The question then is, if we're making the statement about we need more housing, what are we providing them? Are we providing them a problem? Or are we providing them a solution? My suggestion is that we provide them with a solution. And here's how I think it can be done. The problem the government faces right now is pretty clear. They have a transit problem, they have a jobs and economic problem for sure. One of the issues that we've constantly been um, drilling into the provincial government is that this housing isn't just housing, it's housing to help people. So what happens when people get help? What happens when people actually um, are no longer on the street. There are many things that happen. There is a report that came out um, uh, from an organization, or a report study called At Home Chez Soi, that said when you provide housing to people, you actually spend two dollars, and for every one dollar you spend on housing, you spend two dollars and nineteen cents less on emergency care systems, the health care system, and so on and so forth. And those are the kinds of things that get traction with government. And I understand the social benefit and the social issues, but there are many other things that happen. When people are off the street and they're stabilized and they can actually um, have, a, have a good home from which they can have a foundation, they rely less on the emergency rooms. 
Seniors who age in place rely less on health care systems. Some doctors in Sarnia told me one time that people go to hospitals and they get sicker than what they actually went to the hospital with. But if you don't have any home, and you don't have health care, then that's your last, um, that's the last resort. So connecting the dots for them in terms of uh, explaining that by providing housing that they can actually um, save money on the health care system is one arena. Second thing is the shelter system in Toronto, as an example, is very expensive. It costs on average about $60 to $80 a day to have somebody in a shelter on a temporary basis. If you take 60 and multiply it by 30 days, you get $1,800. For less than $1,800, you could house somebody and actually give them support. That's the kind of math that resonates with government. All of a sudden, you've turned the problem of housing into a solution for them. Let's talk about some other things that happen when people get lifted out of, out of poverty and, get lift, and end up in a, in a home. They end up getting a job. What happens when people get jobs? They get paid. When they get paid, they pay taxes. They buy goods and services. All of a sudden now, they're contributing to the economy. Isn't that what the government is looking for? A contribution to the economy? And didn't I just make a link from housing to helping people, to jobs, to the economy? And isn't that the problem that, that our housing solves? So that's how we can actually structure um, our ask. And that's some of the things I often say to people is not to really look at housing as the thing they have to be responsible and fund, but the solution in a much bigger toolbox that they can use to be able to resolve the issues they need. One final thing, guess where businesses like to relocate? Do they relocate in places where their employees can't have housing or there isn't good housing or good amenities? No, they, they like to go to places that have good neighborhoods, good strong community spirits, good services, good health care, good education, the same kinds of things we all want. That's what attracts businesses and that's what creates good community and economic development. So ho hopefully I answered that question, but again, the trick in the whole thing is to frame your ass in a way that solves their problem while talking about housing and connecting the dots for them. Yes, ma'am. The um, article in the star this Lee, morning. Lee, come up. Lee, come up. Yes. The research in, in the star this morning that this group, is it the housing first? It's a, it's a housing first model. Yeah, and, and it could, that seems to me they're providing solutions showing how economically, basically saying what you're saying, that this research has proven it. Yes. So could you so say I anything more about that? Absolutely, I can talk about that. And the fact that the star did an editorial on it too. Was good. Well, um, you know, uh, the, the, the whole issue of, of housing first, and the housing first model essentially says um, that um, uh, what we are going to do is, is help people, particularly those who are homeless and with addictions, and get them housed first. We don't care that they're not clean or sober or, or anything. The issue is get them housed first, get them stable in their housing, and then provide them the supports from which they can have, found, um, uh, have um, uh, um, you know, to, to lead a more productive life. Um, that model, by the way, isn't a, a new model. Um, we have supportive housing providers in Ontario who've been doing this with um, those living with mental illness and those living with developmental disabilities for decades. So the fact that you know a, a new light has been shone on the housing first model is a good thing because now we have some some clear evidence. But it's not necessarily new. It's been it's been worked on for for decades. But I'm very happy to see the research. I'm very happy to see the editorial. Uh, being done because the old way of thinking was that we're not going to give you the housing until you clean yourself up and that model didn't work because people just didn't have access to the supports and the stability that the housing site provides them in order to get clean and, uh, and sober as an example. Booming voice. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I'd like to talk about if you need a microphone. So, um, is there any way that the three levels of government could come together to solve this problem? And I feel that, yeah, is there any way that that can happen? I also feel that the um, government has a responsibility to immigrants coming into the country and then they find the, um, the cost of living is just 
beyond the expectation. Yes. Um, thanks for that. Okay. Thanks for that question. I think it's a um, it's a laudable goal, um, but I will be honest with you, never going to happen. Um, and the reason it, it will never happen is because there are too many political footballs going on. Um, the federal government actually has a different agenda than the provincial government and the municipal governments. And there are, by the way, 449 municipal governments in Ontario. So to try to even get those municipalities to work together is, is um, an impossibility. What is possible amongst the three levels of government is to have a shared responsibility. But they can have a shared responsibility within their own expertise. So, to give you an example, because housing is now downloaded to municipalities, they are in the best position as municipal governments to be able to deal with the bricks and mortar on the property side of the equation. That's what they're in the business of doing. They provide local community services, local community supports, they're funded through property tax dollars. They can do that. The provincial governments and the federal governments are actually um, better equipped and funded to deal with the income side of the equation. They're the ones that should be providing the income supports to people to be able to enable them through rent supplements or housing allowances to actually go out and find uh, the housing that people need. Or providing the services that are needed around uh, supported, uh, supported services for those people who are, in, who are in housing. And the federal government can likewise provide that same kind of, of assistance to the provinces and territories. So they don't necessarily have to kind of hold hands together and agree on how to solve the housing issue. They can come at it from different uh, perspectives and the housing issue will be solved according to their best strengths rather than, than politically infighting in terms of who does what. That's, I've, I've, I've seen this in action and it can work if, if they do it, you know, constructively. I was struck by uh, something that Sharad said about um, we, we live in this compartmentalized world where we expect the housing minister to take care of all the housing related problems. But something he said really resonated with me because I'm one of those people who believe that everything is connected and I think the longer we live the more we realize how, how interdependent all of life is. And <laughs> As he was speaking, I was imagining a conversation with one of my parishioners, Kirsten Mercer, who happens to be a policy advisor for uh, Premier Wynne. And to say, Kirsten, I was at this dinner the other night and I heard the most interesting concept that this problem with the affordable housing really needs to be the task of the transportation department and the <laughs> minister of, of finance and the, and the minister of education and, and uh, you know, all of these people together taking a piece of the pie to see how it can be ameliorated rather than just expecting the housing ministry to auto uh, automatically solve all the problems. So it just reminded me of another way. Sometimes, you know, they call it a paradigm shift where suddenly you realize that the old paradigm simply hasn't worked or, or the, the world has changed to the point where the old paradigm no longer fits the problem. So it could be that what we're seeing and witnessing is the emergence of a new paradigm which looks at the problem, slices and dices it in a different way than we've looked at it before in sort of silos. And now the silos are leaking into one another and there's a, a, new, a new way of looking at hope for the future. <laughs> Any other questions? Nick? Uh, the question was uh, some uh, words on the new provincial housing minister. So the new provincial housing minister is Ted McMeekin. He has been in um, in uh, in uh, uh, he's been a provincial uh, MPP for many years. He is a former mayor from Flamborough um, and also uh, worked on municipal council in the um, uh, in the Hamilton area. Um, so he is quite knowledgeable in terms of of, um, of municipal issues, and hopefully he will. Uh, come up to speed very quickly on the housing issues. I know his staff have been briefing him um, even as of today, and we have a request in to uh, go in and meet him and uh, share uh, some information, and we've invited him to come to the Ontha conference in uh, November as well. No more.
questions, then I think we're at that point in the evening where we say thank you to you. And, and I'll just say keep up the great work because, you know, we're not a one-man band. We are a community of interest and we share that same interest with all of you. So kudos to all of you and the work that you do and uh, we're here to, to work with you and help you as well. Thank you. And thank you all for coming out uh, today, tonight, and uh, there's no reason to rush off. Uh, Laura's waving a name tag. I think she wants them back to use again. And Val, is there anything you want to say to the group as the new chair? For, for being here, and uh, I'm really looking forward to the coming year, working with all of you and uh, making those promises and ideas come to fruition. I think we can do it, don't you? Yeah. Yeah.